Hi, it's Doug here. Welcome to Stock Story. Uh, I'm back from Key West. Uh, it was beautiful weather there. It's pouring rain out here and it's cold. So uh, I got to get used to this uh, <laughs> this new environment I'm in. But it is nice to see family and friends. And I know the weather will get better for the, for the springtime. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, today I'm going to talk about the uh, Stock Story portfolio. Uh, as of March the 11th, I'll do these maybe quarterly or somewhere around quarterly. Okay, stock stories, uh, before I get into it, um, this is uh, for education and entertainment. It's not financial advice. Uh, please do your own due diligence before investing. Hopefully you get some ideas here and get some comfort on how it is to uh, actually uh do your, do your own investing because it is quite a bit of fun and it can be quite rewarding. Uh, but uh, you have to make sure that you've done a lot of homework and you actually understand what you're doing and you're not just following somebody on YouTube or whatever. Anyways, with that aside, uh, let's move forward. So this is my portfolio as at uh, Friday, I think it's November or March the 10th. Um, you'll see here I've got a very heavy uh, cash holding, 48.7%. And if you've been following some of my other videos, you know I feel the stock market's overvalued. Also, even the bond market's overvalued. And because of this, um, I'm holding a lot of cash. Um, I'm actually almost hoping for a correction, but, you know, uh, I do have half half of my money invested, so I am making some money, but certainly not as much as I would if I was fully invested. Um, I also have close to another 6% in fixed income. That used to be much higher, but as I said, uh, the bond markets with interest rate rising and the bond markets, uh, bond prices have gone up so much, uh, they're also at risk too. So uh, I'm, I'm low on equities and bonds and so I'm a lot in cash, which is not what I consider a favorable position, but it's the one I feel is the most diligent at this point. Um, after that, Canadian equities is my next holding uh, at almost 19%. U.S. 15%, and then uh, through ETFs and and other things, I have uh, maybe another 11% or so uh, outside of uh, North America and, and and fixed income. Okay, so th this just shows it again. Percentage of my current holdings is mostly Canadian and United States. So I think I'll move on from there. Um, it's basically the same thing that was in there. And I think next time I do this, I won't even have this page because I don't really see that I need it. Um, here's the sectors that I hold. And, and uh, you see, it's very heavy on financial services. And this is not because I'm a, a lover of financial services. It's because uh, the... I've been finding a lot of good values in insurance companies and some of the banks and stuff like that. And so as a result, I have, I'm have i heavy on financial services. That could change as valuations change. For instance, right here, healthcare is at 12.1%. Uh, it used to be way down. I just only had a couple of percentage points in healthcare. But uh, healthcare has had um, kind of a depressed uh, market for a little while and now so uh, because of it valuations have improved and so I've I've added some um, healthcare stocks uh, technology has been you know the dot-com bubbles technology people always thought technology is over uh, overvalued but uh, actually through that whole period through the uh, after the dot-com crash and then the subprime crash a lot of tech stocks have been quite well valued or, or fairly valued, not some of the high flyers uh, like Netflix and that, but but uh, a lot of the old guard, Microsoft, uh, Apple, all were trading at very good valuations. So I did buy quite a bit of them. I've traded back a little bit of some of them gone up now. So, and I do have a couple of uh, REITs from Canada that uh, pay pretty good dividends on a monthly basis and have some pretty good metrics there. So my top 10 holdings, Bank of Nova Scotia, um, I've, I've just recently reduced that position. Um, it's run up, it's gone up about 40, 
35, 40 percent, uh, as well as paying uh, when I bought it, it was a 5 percent dividend on my original investment. And I've had it since 2014, I believe. So um, I probably gotten about 50 percent. So I took a little bit off the top there and I actually uh, have bought a little bit of CIBC, which seems to be the most undervalued of the big five uh, Canadian banks. I have Facebook, which does not fit my value investing profile, but um the reason I have Facebook is that uh, I just see it growing a lot. I see so many users. It just seems like one of those, um, as Warren Buffett calls it, a, a company with a moat. Uh, I see young. I see old on it. Uh, so I do believe that it's got a strong future. Um, I won't add to this position because I do believe it's overvalued, but I will hold on to it. If there was ever a crash, I would add to the position then. Um this is one of those uh, Canadian REITs I have. It's uh, actually, they actually, it's a Canadian company, but but actually their properties and their rentals are all down in the United States. Uh, Universal Insurance uh, is a, an insurer that I used to have a lot more shares in it. I, I paired them back a bit when Hurricane Matthew went through Florida because Universal Insurance is basically a Florida company. And it did impact their earnings, but they did quite well after it. So I've started to add to the position too. Toronto Dominion is another one that uh, actually I've dropped from the 2.1% because of the fact that uh, they got hit with a bit of a scandal thing yesterday about how uh, some of their staff said that they were um, being pushed to sell products that people didn't need. Um, this is probably an issue for all banks, but um, anyways, Toronto Dominion got dinged with it, so I decided to pair back because once again, it had gone up about 30% and was paying a decent dividend, so I'd had a pretty good return on it. Apple used to be my top holding. Um, I, I paired back on it after a couple of seasons of, of 20 or 30%. Uh, reduction in their earnings. However, their last quarter was 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 fantastic, and so I've added a little bit to the position now. Uh, but as I say, you know, it's a wait and see on some of these things. But uh, Apple's a strong stock, and Warren Buffett's bought in heavily. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's a, a certain level of of confidence in that in that area. Uh, this is a small cap that I found. I don't know the stock quite as well. It's uh, mm -hmm. It's a payment services one, and uh, you know, bottom line is is when you look at the price earnings, you look at the price earnings to growth, you look at balance sheet, look at all those things. All the metrics look really good, but it is something I don't know quite as well. Terra Pharmaceuticals has very good fundamentals, and I am uh, familiar with some of the drugs that 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 are that they have, um, but they were in a lawsuit. I don't think it's going to hurt them as much, and they have started to recover, and their fundamentals look really good. Canadian Apartment REITs is uh, another real estate uh, investment trust that I'm in, and it's uh, uh, I've been told it's the biggest, biggest uh, apartment rental uh, REIT in Canada. And once again, it pays a monthly dividend, so very happy with that. And the last one is an asset management company that I bought quite recently, Guardian Capital. And uh, so far, uh, its its metrics are pretty good. It pays a, a, a dividend, and so I, I'm pretty comfortable with that. But I don't actually have what I'd call a high conviction uh, allocation here. I mean, Frank and Nova Scotia would be the closest possibly Facebook, but really high conviction to me is 5-10% of your portfolio, which means that you really believe in a stock. This is a safety portfolio. Um, I have some other holdings that are over 1%. Uh, in fixed income, I have CBO, which is uh, bonds. It's one to five year laddered bonds. So uh, it's, it's, it's not as risky as some of the long-term bonds. Um, it pays, I don't know, around 3%, close to 3% as far as uh, 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 distribution payment. Uh, just after that, I have here, it's Transglobe. Um, it's, it's a debenture from Transglobe, a convertible debenture, and it actually is going to expire at the end of this month, March. Um, so it uh, was trading. Actually, I had some confusion, so I actually didn't get into it uh, as early as I want. But uh, Transglobe was a company where, when I looked at the uh, 
balance sheet they had lots of cash on their books to debt and this this debenture only had a year left and actually when i first looked at it it was trading at 80 dollars to a par value of 100 uh which meant 25 percent plus it was paying a six percent um interest per annum so right there it was 31 percent unfortunately uh, I'd never bought one before, and there was some complications with the bank. So when I did finally buy it, um, I got it. But but I lo basically what I locked in was 11% gain plus the 6% for 17%. So it looks like I'll get 17% for a year holding of it. It would have been really nice to get that 31%. But as I say, this channel is about learning. I learned a little bit. I had to phone the bank uh the way uh, the online brokerage for Royal Bank handles uh, convertible debentures is a little different. Uh, I had to put the dollar value in where I normally put the unit units of, of shares that I would be buying. Uh, so it was a little bit different. I wasn't successful in the beginning. Unfortunately, I didn't get that 31% in. But I know if I ever see a setup like this again, I would probably bet fairly big on it. However, looking at most convertible debentures, most of them don't have... Uh, the metrics, all the cash. The other thing Transglobe had, even though oil was going down and, and they were showing a net loss in their earnings, their cash flows were actually um, positive and, and significantly positive. So there was a lot of things saying there's no problem that they're going to be able to pay the $100 off, which you bought at a discount, whether you buy it at 90 or 80. Um, and on top of it, you're going to get your 6%. So it, it, this is one of those things. It's a learning thing. And if I could find more setups like this, I would probably want to bet big on them, especially if I could get in where it looked like I was locking in 31% for a year. Uh, down here is High Arctic uh, Energy Services. I used to hold uh, closer to... I don't know, three or four percent of, of this one. Uh, it paid a good dividend. I bought it, uh, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago. Uh, it had gone up uh, 50 percent. It paid me um, around a five percent dividend, I believe, uh, over over the time that I had it. So I'd had a pretty good return. And, and it looked like on the chart, it looked like it was running out of some steam. So I thought I'd pair it back to a smaller position. And then I'll see if it picks up again. It still has good fundamentals. If it picks up again, then I'll, I'll probably add to the position again. Uh, and then Canadian life companies, it's basically life insurance companies in a mutual fund that's a, a, a dividend split corporation. So they do tend to pay out big distributions on a monthly basis. Um, I'm rel relatively new to these types of uh, dividend splits. Uh, however, most of the metrics in it look pretty good and uh, I love the dividend. So that was good. In the end here, then I have Italy, Russia, Spain, and emerging markets uh, dividends. And basically this is, when I look at a heat map of, of, of the world, the expensive stock markets are in North America, or some of the most expensive ones. The cheaper ones are in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Italy, Spain. Uh, China's pretty cheap, I haven't bought into that. Um, Russia's extremely cheap as well. And some of these ones are also paying a good distribution or you could call it a dividend. Uh, they're all ETFs. Um, so anyways, I've probably, when you look at it, it's four, what is it, four or six, about 7% of my portfolio is in other countries. And that's partly because of the overvaluation of the United States and what I see as a, a minor uh, overvaluation in Canada. Um, so when you look at, those two slides that represents about 38% of the stock story portfolio um, and cash is at 48%. So that's about 86% of the portfolio uh, before holdings are under 1%. The remaining 14% is in smaller holdings. And uh, in Canada, I've actually added a position of uh, CIBC because right now they have a P of 10 the return on equity is 25% and they got a 4.5% dividend. So right now they look like the cheapest of the Canadian uh, big five banks. Uh, Magna, which is an uh, uh, auto parts maker, um, I paired back. They, they had a bit of a hit on their last earnings. And there's a little bit of an uncertainty with the, the Trump administration possibly going to change the North American Free Trade Agreement, which would impact their business quite significantly. I didn't 
uh, highlight uh, WEF, but that's Western Forest Products, and they also have a lot of business in the United States. So uh, anything changing in that free trade agreement could affect them as well. So I'm not adding to that position, although the stock has great metrics and is doing very well, as is Mag Mag Magna also has very good metrics as well. Um, so I'm not doing that. I highlighted FGX because that's a gold miners mutual fund that pays around a 7% dividend, which is great because they get paid because gold is fluctuates a bit. But um, there's a lot of talk about fiat currency and, and issues around that and how uh, once we went off the gold standard, money actually is slowly becoming so financially engineered that it really doesn't have a true value. And so I probably over time will increase this position to guard against that. After that, I got other small ones that I'm testing out. This one, APH, is is, uh, is a marijuana play. So this is completely speculative. It had nothing to do with the stock story thing. So I make a tiny, tiny holding in it and, and just experiment with trading it. Um, and then I have a couple of other small ones that are have really good valuation fundamentals in the States. So as of the date that I, I, I looked at the portfolio allocations here and that um, year to date uh, stock story is up 1.06%. Uh, the S&P is up almost 6% and Toronto Stock Exchange is just under 1.5%. In the last five years, uh, stock story is close to 12% up. Uh, S&P is up close to 14%, 2% better than stock story. And Toronto Stock Exchange has been about a little less than half of what stock story was. And so um, I'm pretty happy with this because I'm doing this with not being fully invested. And so I am not getting the gains. If I, if I was fully invested, then you could possibly see uh, if it was just had doubled what I what I actually owned and, and that sort of thing, uh, all these numbers could have been doubled. But I also would be uh, exposing myself to what I see as risk in a high, highly valued market. So I've chosen not to do that. And so um, I'm happy that I'm gaining. I'm happy that I'm not too far off the indexes. And I do believe that I'm, it's going to pay off for me if there is a significant correction because one of two things, my, my, my portfolio won't go down as much because the cash won't be infected. Uh, some things like gold and, and maybe even the bonds might go up um, as well as uh, I'm hoping that the ETFs from the other other countries like Russia and Eastern Europe and, and, and that sort of thing will not be affected as much. Uh, as a result, uh, I'll have less of a downdraft on, a, on, a, on a, a significant correction. And more importantly, I'll have a significant amount of cash to buy equities that have gone on sale. And that's the key part of my value investing thing. So anyways, that's it. I uh, hope you like this video. I hope you're enjoying the different videos I'm doing. Please share, share this video, uh, like it. Uh, subscribe to my channel and please, I love to hear comments and, and questions and, and love to uh, uh, share ideas with different people on the internet. So anyways, until the next time, I uh, hope you're having a great day and we'll talk to you soon.